PubMed is deficient when it comes to solving this puzzle of cardiovascular disease, obesity, and diabetes. PubMed is the gold standard in the Bible of the medical community, and there's some really expensive and extensive research regarding diet and whether you should eat meat or not or plants or not involving you know billions of dollars and millions of people and it all is heading towards the same direction that there's this thing called LDL and on um, involved with LDL is ApoB and uh, ApoB is the main cause of cardiovascular disease so therefore reduce your LDL and therefore reduce the saturated fat and therefore eat tons of vegetables and a low carb diet with uh, red meat and uh, animal fats is bad and we've heard this now since 1980 when these USDA food pyramid was quote unquote hijacked by a vegan named Dr. Hegstead. And without the science, he said, we, we have nothing to lose. We have to recommend a low fat diet. And the McGovern Commission went with it. And it's, that's been our, an experiment on the whole population. And it, this experiment has failed and we are suffering. But as I look through uh, the research, and I've been watching a bunch of clinicians and researchers, and also this uh, really good uh, interpreter of the research, and I'll, I'll feature him later, Dr. Gill. Amazing information coming from him and the way that he interprets uh, PubMed and the science there. Um, I'll feature that in a bit. But with all that information, it comes down to one thing, lower your LDL, because ApoB is attached to LDL, and ApoB is the cause of heart disease. And so people are doing this. They're taking their statin drugs and they're not eating meat. As a matter of fact, the consumption of meat is down 28% in the last 50 years. This graphic right here in the red, it says red meat down 28% since 1970. So we're doing what the USDA is telling us to do. And we're eating more vegetables, more fruit, more grains, more vegetable oils. That's up 87%. And we'll get to that. And then less whole milk, less eggs, less animal fats, and less butter. But here's the kicker. So I said the vegetable oils are going up, and it shows that. And then we have obesity going up just with it, the red and the orange together. But the medical research, PubMed, shows that when you eat um, vegetable oils, you end up having less cardiovascular risk. And if you eat the same amount of calories, then people stay the same weight or maybe lose a little bit of weight. So therefore, vegetable oils are better than saturated fats from animal meat. And so that's been the message now for 50 years. But I have research that shows that the vegetable oils cause a lot of damage to the human body. But most of the research in PubMed shows that it doesn't because they're drawing blood and they're looking at markers in the blood only. And that's the problem. And we'll get to that in a second. For a long time, a lot of us were saying we have to cut back on the carbs including me, I said it for many, many years, and it's still a true statement, but look, obesity is up and carb intake is down, and that's down since 2000, and I think that's because of the internet, because people like Dr. Mercola were very adamant about stopping uh, high fructose corn syrup, et cetera. So is it really carbs causing an increase in cardiovascular disease and, chronic, and other chronic diseases? Possibly, high fructose corn syrup, we'll get to that. But carbs in, in general, it doesn't line up with obesity as this graph shows. In this graph, you can see the rise of vegetable oil intake like this from left to right from beginning in 1900. And yet the saturated fat consumption has stayed the same, gone up a little bit over the course of these last 100 years. But heart disease deaths has gone up like this. And the reason why it plateaued beginning in 1980 or so, 70, was this attempt at statin usage and advances in... Um, medical procedures, pacemakers, open heart surgery. So the mortality has plateaued. Now it's kind of ticking up in the last three or five years. But if saturated fat was this high in 1910, why isn't heart disease death this high in 1910? It rose up with the vegetable oils. Oh, and did I mention at the very end, I'm gonna give you the solutions. So we're gonna talk about vegetable oils. So here's an example of a study that's pretty standard and is quite extensive as to what it's testing when people drink vegetable oils are consumed in foods. So it says effects of polyunsaturated fatty acids, that's vegetable oils, now known as seed oils, compared with saturated fats from meat, for example, 
on liver fat, lipoproteins, and inflammation in abdominal obesity, a randomized controlled trial. So this is the top best research. It's a randomized controlled trial. And they study a lot of things. So they measured liver fat, and it went down with the vegetable oils. They also measured these inflammatory markers like TNF receptor, IL-1 receptor. They also measured insulin total to HDL cholesterol ratio, LDL cholesterol, triglycerides. And it shows that PUFA vegetable oils are better than butter from animals. And there are many, many studies like this, the gold standard. And then you do a meta-analysis of all these randomized control trials. And it shows over and over again that it's better to eat canola oil or safflower oil or a soybean oil rather than steak and butter and whole milk. It's like getting, you can go to a restaurant and get deep fried fish and they put it in the basket and deep dip it in this big old tub of seed oils and it's totally healthy according to PubMed. So the problem is what they're measuring. And when you take in these seed oils, they have a fatty component called linoleic acid. So possibly the worst part about seed oils is linoleic acid. Now there is good linoleic acid like omega-3 um, fish oils, and there's bad like the seed oils in excess. So linoleic acid is in seed oils in high concentrations compared to animal fats. And I'll show you a graphic for that. In this research, it says, can linoleic acid contribute to coronary artery disease? Well, all the majority of studies over the many, many decades, the answer is no, because they're measuring blood. In this one, they're measuring the adipose tissue. The adipose tissue concentration of linoleic acid was positively associated with the degree of coronary artery disease. And it also says the platelet linoleic acid concentration was also positively associated with coronary artery disease. So how much linoleic acid is in the platelets within the anatomy and physiology of the tissue structures rather than just what's in the blood? Here's a study where they measured linoleic acid in breast milk. So again, it's not in the blood, it's actually in the structure of the human body. And it says the association between linoleic acid levels in colostrum and child cognition at two and three years in the Eden cohort. So what they did is they measured the linoleic acid in the mother's breast milk out of 709 breastfed children. And it says, Levels of linoleic acid were negatively associated with motor and cognitive scores. Children breastfed with the highest levels of linoleic acid tended to score closer to the never breastfed children than children breastfed with the lowest levels of linoleic acid. What's that, what that means is that kids that are never breastfed, they're given formula, and the main ingredients of the formula include linoleic acid. So if the mom is consuming a lot of linoleic acid, it goes to the baby, it stunts their growth, their physical and brain development. It's very damaging to the human body. In this study, they're measuring bioactive oxidized linoleic acid metabolites. They're called oxlams. These four oxlams have been me mechanistically linked to pathological conditions ranging from cardiovascular disease to chronic pain. Plasma oxlams, which are elevated in Alzheimer's dementia, and non-alcoholic liver inflammation have been proposed as biomarkers used for indicating the presence of severity of both conditions. So what they did in this study is they lowered the linoleic acid in the diet, they cut out the seed oils, and then they measured the oxalam, the metabolites, and, and they went down. And it says that um, doing this type of diet reduces oxidized linoleic acid derivatives, which have been implicated in a variety of pathological conditions. When it comes to LDL and ApoB, the worst part is the oxidized LDL. That means it's damaged. It's like rust on a car. So in the study, they lowered the meat intake, the saturated fat, for uh, two groups of people. And in one group, then, they raised the, veg the vegetables up high. And the other ones, the vegetables went up a little bit, but they added in polyunsaturated fats, the seed oils. And this is the result. They measured oxidized LDL. They didn't measure just LDL, which is what all the studies do. This is oxidized LDL. It says the median plasma oxidized LDL increased by 27% in response to the low-fat, low-vegetable diet, and then 19% in response to the low-fat, high-vegetable diet. 
Also, the total lipoprotein A, LP little a, which is another biomarker, it's a disaster for heart disease. That marker was increased by 7% and 9% respectively. So decreasing meat and increasing the seed oils increases oxidized LDL and lipoprotein A. Those are two of the worst biomarkers for cardiovascular disease. This right here, this one study disproves all the epidemiology observational studies and you could say the randomized control trials because the other randomized control trials are not measuring oxidized LDL and instead they're just measuring LDL and other markers. It gets very specific when it comes to these seed oils. They're very tricky and they, that's why they're causing mystery and confusion and no results. This is why so many people are getting overweight because they think that they can have free reign on polyunsaturated fatty acids and they're eating deep fried food. But most importantly, I'm going to get to this with a special video. I'm going to show you that when you eat a low fat diet, you end up eating more junk food. In this study, they're measuring sex hormones in men. And what they did is they lowered the animal fat intake and they raised up the seed oils. And what it says is our results indicate that in men, a decrease in dietary fat content and an increase in the degree of unsaturation of fatty acids, meaning the plant oils, reduces the serum concentrations of androcinidione, testosterone, and free testosterone. So you've heard about this, the sperm counts dropping over the last 50 years, probably from eating vegetable oils. And there's going to be other factors, maybe agricultural sprays like atrazine, uh, herbicides, and pesticides. But this, is, this study right here shows that seed oils are culprit in uh, making uh, men's testosterone levels lower. And this is the last one. This is about macular degeneration of the eye. And it says, the results higher vegetable fat consumption was associated with an elevated risk for macular degeneration. So if these vegetable oils are so healthy for us and everybody should be consuming them and avoiding meat, then why is it that these vegetable oils in clinical trials destroy the eyes through macular degeneration? They harm children when they're consuming breast milk with linoleic acid. They are proven to cause atherogenesis in the heart, and they cause these nasty metabolites that, ca that cause a lot of damage, and they increase oxidized LDL and lipoprotein A. So what I've proven to you is that vegetable oils are bad without a doubt, but the trick is you have to measure the right markers in the body. I have to say something about nutritional epidemiology, where they take surveys and they ask people, how's their health and how's your diet? and they try to come with, up with conclusions, but that's impossible to do because of what's called the healthy user bias. And there's a couple other biases, but this is where healthy people do a lot of things to stay healthy. And unhealthy people don't do a lot of things to try to be healthy. So the healthy people tend to avoid red meat and the unhealthy people eat a lot of red meat, but they also shoot guns, they drive cars without seatbelts, they smoke and drink and they don't exercise and they eat junk food. So there's too many factors there to say that um, red meat causes chronic disease. So this is John Yonides. I've talked about him before. He's a meta-researcher. He's from Stanford. He says nutritional epidemiology is a scandal. It should just go to the waste bin. Now, there's a diet that was published in 2019. It's called the Eat Lancet Diet. And this uh, obeys all the rules from PubMed. It's low in animal fat, low in saturated fat, high in seed oils and polyunsaturated fats, are therefore linoleic acid, and it's high in vegetables. And you're only allowed, I think, two ounces of meat per day or something, or seven ounces per week. It's a ridiculously low amount of animal food. And John Yonidi says, the health claims in the Eat Lancet diet are science fiction. I can't call it anything else. So I'm just dismissing any epidemiological studies. Whenever you hear the word link or associated with, that means that it's not science. But there is a link in association with falling down and chewing gum or eating red meat and having heart disease. There's no causality there. You can't say that an epidemiological survey proves this hypothesis that red meat or saturated fat causes any disease. There are zero scientific clinical experiments to prove that hypothesis that red meat causes any disease. Zero. And if you don't like my statement, Put the study down in the comments, and I will retract my statement. I've been looking since 2017 for any study that shows that red meat has got to be a clinical 
scientific experiment to show that red meat causes disease and there's none. So now that I've proven to you that seed oils are very unhealthy, you should know uh, why um, people eat seed oils in such abundance. And there's a clinical scientific experiment done. It's called Diet Fits. And in this study, they had people uh, do a low-fat diet, and another group did a low-carb diet. And what they found out was many things, but one thing is that when you reduce the fat, then people end up eating more junk food. So that's been the experiment in the, in the United States population since 1980, is reduce the fat, reduce the meat, and then people don't go to eat more green beans and asparagus. What they do is they end up eating more junk food. So, so that's the main problem. And I'm going to mention Dr. Gill. He's got his YouTube channel called Nutrition Made Simple. He's absolutely brilliant at re interpreting the PubMed research. And I grabbed a snippet from his YouTube channel. I'm going to show you that right now. Now, there was an important caveat, specifically in the fat restriction group. So here's Dr. Aronica explaining what happened. Those following an ultra low fat diet for three months ended up uh, actually uh, increasing their um, uh, consumption of refined grains by over 50% by the study end. And in contrast, uh, those following a high fat ketogenic like diet, um, although they at three months, although they, they slowly reintroduced refined carbohydrates um, throughout the study, at the end of the study, they had reduced the intake of refined grains by over 50% compared to baseline. So just to show you the numbers on that refined grain intake, around 100 grams a day of intake at baseline, no significant difference between the two groups. By three months, lower in both, especially on low carb, dramatic reduction on low carb, almost no refined grain intake. And by one year, both had gone up, both had rebounded a bit, but much less on low carb. The low carb group is still getting about half of the refined grains they were eating before the trial, whereas the people cutting fat were actually eating more refined grains than before the trial and four times more than people on low carb. Added sugars, similar picture overall, about 50 grams a day intake before the trial, no significant difference between three months, both reduced, especially low carb, and by one year, both rebounded and less so on low carb. So that's the crux of the last 50 years, why chronic illness is going up, up, up. It's because we're trying to do a low fat diet and it doesn't work, and then you eat junk food. So the sugar goes up more than baseline, the refined grains go up more than baseline, and guess what? Along with that comes the seed oils. That study was done by Dr. Christopher Gardner. It's called the Diet Fit Study. And then Dr. Lucia was one of the analysts of the data. And then that was Dr. Gill at Nutrition Made Simple. He is the best interpreter of the conventional PubMed research when it comes to diet and cardiovascular disease. And so make sure you check out his channel. But remember what I'm teaching you in this video, why PubMed is deficient and why when we follow the actual instructions from PubMed, it's very detrimental to our health. So I've pretty well proven that red meat is not the cause of this epidemic of cardiovascular disease and other chronic illnesses. And there's five reasons that may be causing this skyrocketing uh, incidence of chronic disease, including heart disease. But number one, seed oils. So I went through that pretty well. Number two, electromagnetic frequencies and radio frequencies. These are things that are skyrocketing since uh, the 1900s when electricity was first installed throughout the United States. And then number three, agricultural chemical sprays and other environmental toxins such as plastic and dioxin and, and a whole bunch of herbicides and pesticides. And those have been skyrocketing. These are all factors that are skyrocketing, just like um, chronic illness and, and autoimmune disease. Okay, number four, drywall construction, growing mold after water intrusion. So our homes used to be made out of plaster inside, and now it's paper. Plaster walls did not grow mold. So the moment that water touches drywall, it starts growing mold within 24 hours. And I can see like a possible epidemic of mold illness from homes that have been damaged or not maintained. The roof starts leaking, the windows start leaking. Maybe there's a hurricane, maybe there's a flood in the basement. And that can cause chronic disease for a lot of people. I've seen them. And then the last one is chronic hidden infections such as root canals. And I'm going to go into this more. So chronic hidden infections in old root canals or maybe where teeth were extracted, such as wisdom teeth, you can have a festering infection and it's causing no disease at that site whatsoever, but it can be going down into the body. And I got some studies to show you on this. This has chronic inflammatory diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, psoriasis, and infections such as periodontal disease and HIV 
are associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So these organisms that can be throughout the body can land in the heart. They can affect toes, they can causing arthritis, they can affect nails, like nail beds with fungus, they can affect your skin, causing rashes on the skin, and certainly they can cause uh, harm to the arteries around the heart. Now this is important right here. The most common changes are decreases in HDL and increases in triglycerides. That looks like diabetes. So if you have a chronic infection in your body causing a variety of symptoms, that can also cause what looks like to be cardiovascular disease. So it says right here, the most common changes are a decrease in HDL and an increase in triglycerides. These are people with these diseases. It also includes an increase in VLDL production. Next, it says with inflammation, there's also a consistent increase in lipoprotein A levels. So the point is that we're blaming the diet when it's probably an infection. We're blaming the diet for a lot of diseases when it's probably an infection, including heart disease. Here it says LDL is more easily oxidized, so we have an increase in oxidized LDL caused by infection. Now, medicine is great at acute infections. They give you antibiotics for five or 10 days, fantastic. But when it comes to chronic infections, parasites, mold, viruses, medicine sucks at that. And even with peptic ulcers, it took them 50 years to realize, oh, okay, they were right. You can have H. pylori in the stomach causing an ulcer. Uh, it's a chronic infection causing ulcers, and they give people antibiotics, but it doesn't help very well because it's more of a condition of returning the tissue back to viability and eliminating bad food from the diet. It's not just about giving antibiotic for an ulcer. This is interesting. The greater the severity of the underlying inflammatory disease, the more consistently these abnormalities in lipids and lipoproteins are observed. So the sicker somebody is with chronic infection in their body, the worse their heart disease looks. And, and then you want to try to crush the LDL with statins and make them exercise and eat right when it's an infection. I mentioned earlier that ApoB oxidized is the worst thing for your heart. And I asked the question, this is Google AI, and there's the study right there, American Heart Association. Um, my question was, does infection raise ApoB? And it says, yes, infection can raise ApoB levels. For example, ApoB levels increase from days two to seven after the flu. So again, what if it's a chronic infection? So this is the study in circulation. HDL loses its anti-inflammatory properties during acute flu. And it says right here, ApoB levels increase from days two to seven after infection. So in this article, it says ApoB is an innate barrier against invasive staph infection. What if you have a staph infection for five years in duration or 20 years in duration and it's hidden in the body somewhere and it's small. Maybe it's in the appendix, very small, subacute, no fever, no pain. What if it's in your jawbone? You can have a raging infection, cavitation in your jawbone, no pain, no gum recession, no cavity, and all, all your, your only symptom is breast cancer or your only symptom is placking in the arteries. There's a ton of people with chronic antibiotic resistant staph in their sinuses. Year after year after year, they're blowing their nose, they're, they can't breathe at night. The seasonal changes make it worse and they go to a doctor and they say, oh, here's your, take your Benadryl or take whatever drug has not been banned by the FDA uh, and, or maybe you need surgery, but there's a chronic staph infection in there. And so then therefore ApoB goes up, it's oxidized and it causes heart disease because of this. A lot of chronic diseases are an infection for a long period of time, a long duration infection, and medicine misses it. It's not in their wheelhouse to go after it because antibiotics don't work very well in those situations. You have to rehabilitate the body back to a healthy level, and it takes a lot of detoxing, get rid of parasites, get rid of chemicals and metals, eat the right food, and know the technology of rehabilitating cells and tissue, and that's where the holistic nutritionists come in. Now, this is a standard study here. It says effects of a very high saturated fat diet on LDL particles in adults with atherogenic dyslipidemia, a randomized control trial, and it says results, consumption of the high saturated fat diet resulted in a significantly greater increase from baseline in ApoB and total LDL particles. So if you have a person 
that has a higher rate of these atherogenic lipids, are they getting heart disease? My contention is if they have an infection in their body, oxidizing those particles. That's what's missing in all of healthcare. Chronic infection for years of duration. But you can have somebody who's healthy, no hidden infections, no sinus infections, no root canals that went bad, no wisdom teeth extraction sites, no toenail fungus, no rashes on their skin anywhere, no indication of any aches or pains anywhere. Any imaging that's done shows no infections. Their white blood cell count is normal. You know, their immune system is strong. They have high ApoB, high LDL. Are they going to have heart disease? My contention is no, because they don't have this chronic infection that oxidizes their lipids. So this is the greatest value of eating a meat-based diet is that it maintains the structure of your body. It's the best diet to fight infections, and it makes your tissue strong, your lymphatic tissues, your lymph nodes, your white blood cells, that's tissue, your membranes, leaky gut. You can have leaky capillaries. You want to maintain the structure of those tissues so that these membranes aren't leaking. You want to have a strong brain. You want to have strong muscles. That's why meat is so important to eat. And when a doctor says, oh, meat is bad for you, that is absolutely not true. But then they'll show you randomized control trials showing that saturated fat from meat is bad. It's hard to argue against that, but I just showed you how those are incorrect because they're missing this data. The data is this. When you avoid meat, you end up eating junk food. And when you eat junk food, you end up eating seed oils. You end up eating lots of linoleic acid. Linoleic acid destroys your body. It destroys your tissues. It destroys your immune system. These dead tissues then are eaten by organisms, Lyme organisms, candida, fungus, bacteria, parasites. All these organisms love dead tissue. Mold makes mycotoxins to kill your tissue. Tuberculosis makes toxins to kill your tissue. These organisms want your tissue dead so they can have dinner. The opposite of that is meat. Meat maintains the strength and structure of your tissues in your body, your brain, your bones, your muscle, your skin, your immune system, your circulatory system. Everything gets better when you have an adequate amount of all the amino acids and the animal fats that come with meat. So when you don't eat meat, your body can start catabolizing itself. What is it doing? It's eating your own meat. Like vegans, they get skinny because their body needs meat. And so since they're not eating it, they start to lose their muscle mass. Their body's eating the meat inside. Same thing with people who are very overweight, eating a lot of junk food. They're not eating enough protein. Their muscles get really small. And then their fat cells get really big. They get chronic infections. Their ApoB goes up. Their LDL goes up. Their cardiovascular markers get worse. They get placking. Now let's talk about a type of organism that is indicated in the placking problem. This is in the journal Circulation. This is 2003. And there's a ton of more research on this subject of what's called nanobacteria. Nanobacteria were discovered in 1998. It's kind of relatively new. And back then, the research was like, hey, is this real or is it fantasy? Now there's tons of research showing that it's real. It's been verified in countries throughout the whole world. And what's tricky about nanobacteria is that they're half, they uh, reproduce every six days. And so you, usually with an organism, you pull it out of some tissue, you put it in a Petri dish, and 24 hours later, it went from hardly detectable to very large. But for nanobacteria to reproduce, like I said, six days, they'll go into a fast phase of their life where they're producing the mucus that they live in and at that point they're reproducing every three days and nanobacteria were sent to the international space station and in space they reproduce every day so they're very slow reproducing but what's interesting about them okay they've been isolated from multiple human tissues including atherosclerotic plaque so they fulfill what's known as Koch's postulates there and they also produce a lipopolysaccharide biofilm that induces the inflammatory cascade. That's super important. Now, a lot of organisms make biofilm. If you have mold in your ventilation, it'll be wet, you know, if there's moisture in there, and it'll be kind of like slippery wet. And that's biofilm. Parasites make their own biofilm. Well, in this example, these organisms have been found in the plaque, in the arteries, 
and they make that biofilm, which then turns into, it fixes calcium and phosphorus to form a self-protecting apatite coating, A-P-A-T-I-T-E. What is apatite? A widely occurring pale green to purple mineral. It's a, it's a rock. It's a stone. These organisms make your tissues into stone. Now, this researcher named Rasmussen reported the identification of nanobacteria in calcified human vascular tissue. So the nanobacteria are actually inside the stone in your heart that the coronary artery calcium score finds. And when people get a coronary artery calcium score remeasured yearly, there's an average rate of 33 to 38% increase year over year. Is that because nanobacteria replicate so slowly? They replicate at the rate of 44% per year. So the therapy here is to break the calcium, get into it, and kill the organism. There are supplements for that. I've been carrying one now for, what, seven, eight years. I know of cardiologists, they carry other products that do exactly that. They break through the calcification and go after the organism. These types of supplements are also really good for not just heart, but autoimmune conditions too. And I've talked about this years ago on my YouTube channel. I've had some people with really bad autoimmune uh, conditions, no heart disease, but these types of supplements were the best thing that they've ever taken. Regardless of what kind of infection it is, it needs to be cleaned up and the tissue needs to be repaired. Now let's talk about bigger, wider solutions. What can we do as a society? Number one, ban linoleic acid as a uh, additive in oils. And so with this study, it says linoleic acid, a narrative review of the effects of increased intake in the standard American diet and associations with chronic disease. And this graphic right here shows the cooking oils. And then up here it says linoleic acid, average value. And we have safflower oil at the very top, 70% of that oil is linoleic acid. And all these seed oils, including rice bran, uh, go from 70 down to 19%. And those should be taken off the market. They need to be banned as a food at, at the governmental levels, federal level. And then we have olive oil at 10%. That's a fruit oil. Same thing with avocado oil. And then palm oil, the tropical oil is at 10%. Lard is at 10%. Okay, those are fine. They're like orange and yellow and green, but we can ban the red ones. These yellow, green, orange, um, they can stay. The other part of the solution is ban fructose sweeteners. Fructose is primarily metabolized in the liver, and it turns the fructose into fat and stores it in the liver, and we end up with fatty liver disease. Up to 46% of people in the U.S. have fatty liver disease, and it's because of high fructose sweeteners, whether it's corn or agave. The current high fructose corn syrup is only 50% fructose. The new ones are going to be 95% fructose. And the reason why is because fructose isn't even really that sweet. So you have to put a lot of fructose in that liquid to make it sweet. So if we banned high fructose sweeteners and we banned those seed oils that I showed in the red, simply put, it'll change the whole course in all of healthcare. Get back to eating real meat, cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes will plummet. I've been interacting with some of the USDA Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee they have to update the food pyramid every five years. They're working on it now. Their deadline is the, at the end of 2024. Uh, I have no confidence in them whatsoever that they will see this information and work with it. The way that the big food controls your dinner plate is by installing these 20 people every five years into this advisory committee. These people do not understand what I just said. None of them are clinicians. Maybe one's a clinician, but they're all professors and they're vegans and vegetarians, and they don't know what I just told you. And it is pretty tricky. Let's, let's admit that in order to understand that these vegetable oils are so bad because you have to measure the right thing in the body, you have to measure the tissue, the hormones, the, the breast milk, the adipose tissue. You have to measure that directly. You have to measure the platelets. You can't just go into the blood and look at LDL, HDL, lipoprotein A, ApoB. B. That'll give you the opposite of the truth. You have to actually measure the tissue. The people that most have your back on this subject are the low-carb people, the low-carb speakers, the doctors, the seminars, the um, nutritionists. They at least have an inkling that when you eat a high-carb diet, that it causes more disease. Again, even though saturated fat is linked with cardiovascular disease quite strongly, 
I think it's because that there's a ton of seed oils in the body and there's chronic infections in the body. But if you have no chronic infections and your, your uh, lipids are high, I think you're totally fine. I think we are distracted by following lipids, by just trying to crush LDL. That's a distraction to what really is going on with our health. And in order to fix that, you got to think more holistically. What does it take to get rid of a long-term chronic infection? What sort of supplements and herbs do a good job of helping the immune system? Because if you take an antibiotic for a year, that's not so good. But you can take herbs that are antimicrobial, and your body loves the, that herb, but the organisms hate it. In the meantime, have the right diet to strengthen your tissue and then detoxify all the chemicals. Everybody's got chemicals in their body, everybody. And everybody's got some level of Lyme disease in their body. Lyme are organisms inside the cells. They're hard to find. There are labs for that. But everybody's got some degree of organisms inside their cells. And these chronic infections raise um, oxidation of ABOB and LDL, et cetera. They destroy your body. I'll put the links below. Now, this is a big subject, and it's quite a puzzle. I hope I walked you through it and you understand it. I like to solve puzzles. Look at this. I bought this in 1980 when it first came out. And then I bought a booklet on how to solve it, and, I've been, and I solved it that year. But that's my game. I don't interpret the research and then follow it step by step. My tools are nutrition and supplements, and that's it. I don't do surgery. I don't do drugs. But under that category of tools of uh, nutrition and supplements, it's this big. It's a huge uh, subject, and that's what I use to help pe people get well. But behind that, you have to know why. And I can figure out like what's true and what's not. And I can apply that clinically. I can apply it to myself. And when it makes sense, people get better. When you have the right reason why somebody's unhealthy, it opens a door for a true handling of the problem. And when you look at the chronic disease of, of heart disease going up, 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 and then it, the mortality dropped off a little bit because of drugs and surgery. But like if we were to actually get to the core of this, it should just plummet. So we banned trans fats in 2018. We should be able to do the same thing with linoleic acid and fructose. And that would be fantastic if that happened. And then drug companies will go under. And that's my purpose in life is a bankrupt drug companies.